Hello, I'm at Super Judge and I'm so blessed to be bringing God's truth to you today. Praise God. Hey, before going to today's broadcast, can we make requests for our daily bread? Are you ready? Now, this is very important and I, I believe that your spirit will catch this. When we make this demand, number one, we are obeying the command the Lord gave to me. He gave to us on this broadcast. I tell, you know, on this broadcast, every day on this broadcast, you must make my children demand for their daily bread. Number two is in line with what Jesus taught. He says, give us this day our daily bread. So when you obey God like that, now what does that do to you? It's bringing you into understanding his plan. See, when God gives you command like that, and then you, you see the relationship it has with what he has said before, meaning he's bringing something to your remembrance. That's exactly what Jesus said. And that's how the Holy Spirit helps us. He just comes to you and he gives you a command. Now, if you're a student of the Bible, in, uh, now you, you look at that command and somehow... The more you search the scriptures, it begins to resonate and brings an understanding to what the scriptures have said. See? So, what we are doing is very spiritual. So, Jesus said, do this. And then it's our place to obey him. And that's where life comes from. Praise God. So, are you ready? Say with me, Father, I demand right now for my daily bread. It's coming to me in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. You see, every time we do this, don't ever get used to it. Now, it's, it's, it's possible you are so used to it as, okay, it's praying that prayer again. Hey, it's an opportunity. That's the challenge when God gives you something to become your pattern. After the first period, the first season of that thing, you become complacent. I mean, okay, we're doing it again. No, the, the purpose of that thing is that it's an opportunity for you to remember and release your faith. Remember and release your faith. Are you getting what I'm saying? So don't ever make it, oh, okay, it's, mm -hmm, mm, amen, amen. No, no, release your faith. How do you release your faith? I've told you before. Say it knowing that these things that you are saying will come to pass. So when I make demand for, even me that I'm leading you, I do it in faith for myself and for you. So I expect testimonies to happen today. I expect provisions to come to me today. What kind of provision? Whatever I need. If it's peace, I need. If it's money, I need. If it's um, favor, I need. If it's the need is to find someone somewhere. They are all needs. And it's all part of your daily bread. It could be healing you need in your body. It's all part of your daily bread. Because someone is getting healed today. Praise God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We just bless you, Lord. Thank you for fulfilling what Jesus said, that you will guide us into all truth. And thank you for confirming to us that Jesus was true and right. We bless you, Lord. Fulfill your word and fulfill your good pleasure in us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. So we, we, we began to talk about something yesterday from Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5. It says, let your conversation be without covetousness. Now, this is a very strong command. And I showed you yesterday, he's giving this command in line with what Jesus said. Jesus said, beware of covetousness. Now, when you talk about beware of covetousness, people just, uh, God does not want us to be too rich. No, that's not what he's talking about. You see, sometimes because of lack of understanding, we quickly summarize um, something and give it a wrong meaning. And that meaning begins to affect everything we do. It affects the, our faith in God. So God says, Jesus said, beware of covetousness. And someone says, see, God doesn't want you to have so much 
No, it's not about having so much. In fact, that's the reason he is telling you to be aware of this thing called covetousness because he wants to bless you. I'll give you an example yesterday. You go to a house. Now, you are supposed to go to that house, okay? And then the person puts on the gates. Beware of dogs. Or oh, some people, beware of snakes. See? Now, what are they telling you? They know you would love to come in there. They know you may be giving access into that place. But there is something that may affect your coming in or enjoying what you're supposed to do there. So in order to help you so that you will plan yourself and know how to go about it. It's not a way to tell you not to come now. Of course, if you're an unwanted visitor, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Now, for if really it's for unwanted visitor, they are not even supposed to put it there. You come in and see what you get. But because of visitors who may legally um, be welcome in that place, they put those signs. Yeah? They put those signs. So now when you're coming in, because the dogs are not kept outside, so why do you put beware of dogs on your gate for dogs that are inside? It has to do with only those who plan to come inside. See that now? So you're coming inside. We want you to enjoy your stay, but there are dogs here. So ask the right questions. Understand your, the way you go around here so you have a wonderful stay. Are you getting what I'm saying? So God wants to bless you. This is not in any way something to show because people have this frame kind of mindset. See? So Jesus met the rich young ruler. You remember, I told you that story yesterday. And this man was so rich and blessed by God. He was a good man and he was wealthy. He's kept the command of the Lord. He said so and Jesus did not rebuke him or say he was lying. Jesus beholding him loved him and said go sell everything you have give to the poor and come follow me and it's so easy to look at that scripture and say hmm Jesus doesn't want us to be so wealthy and rich can't you see that man he told him he said so all of you that have money go and sell everything you have and give to the poor no today they won't say give to the poor they say bring it to church praise God that's just it praise God so you, you know what I'm talking about so go get out, do away with everything you have. Okay. And give to the poor. Okay. Or give it away. Okay. So Jesus doesn't want us to be rich. Jesus doesn't want us to have things. No, not at all. But you see, that man came to Jesus with a question. I want life. He was rich. A lot of people would just be okay to get to his level. Man, if I get to his level, what else do I need? That's life now. But imagine this guy had all he had, but then he still was searching for something that he didn't have. Not physical thing now. He's got all those physical comforts. Now, it tells you one thing. I want you to li really listen to what I'm telling you. It tells you one thing, that that guy began his journey with a sincerity of purpose. He began his journey not to have money. There was something his heart was yearning for. And because he was yearning for that thing, he began to please God. Now, in pleasing God, he got rich. Because he told Jesus, he said, all these things I've kept from my youth. I don't think he was keeping all those things from his youth so that he would be rich. No. No. If that was his target, then he, he, he would, I mean, he would have looked at Jesus and said, I think I'm even more righteous than you because what do you have? Because physically, Jesus didn't have much. You, you won't rate Jesus as a rich man. You understand what I'm talking about? You won't rate Jesus as a rich man in his day, the day he walked this earth. So there were people who came to Jesus and they knew they were rich. See? Now, so this guy started out his journey yearning for something deeper. Now, in the process of pleasing God for that thing, he became very rich. Now, having become very rich, he still had questions in his heart. I don't think I've gotten there yet. 
I don't think I've gotten there yet. Uh, there's something more to all these things I have. So he heard about Jesus and, and, and he, he saw the works of Jesus. And I think this man carries what I have. I think so. So let me go meet him. And then he came to Jesus and he says, Look, sir, I need life. What must I do? See, that was the question that was in his heart beyond everything that he had. What must I do that I will have life? And Jesus said, you know the scripture, keep it. Now the same thing, you know, it's funny. The same thing this man has been doing from his youth. So when Jesus said, you know the scripture, keep it. He said, I've kept these things from my youth. Meaning, there's something more. There's something more. And, and Jesus looked at him and loved him. Why did Jesus love him? Because this is one person. You know, there are people that met Jesus, that got Jesus really excited. This was one of them. You remember that, that scribe that came to Jesus and asked Jesus. And funny enough, the two people that really pleased Jesus, they were people that came with questions. Now, the question they asked was, now, you know, there is a way someone asks a question, like this person just wants to bother me. But there is a way someone asks a question, you know that, hey, this person is digging into something really deep. So that scribe came to Jesus and said, Master, what's the first commandment? Actually, what's the best commandment? And Jesus told him, he says, The Lord thy God is one, and you shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And the second is that come to you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the man looked at Jesus and said, You're right. Imagine Jesus, someone marking Jesus' script. <laughs> and he said, You're right. And, and what he said next showed why he asked that question. He told Jesus, you're right, because God does not so much desire burnt offerings and sacrifices, but that a man should know him and understand him. And then two, that a man should love his neighbor as himself. So this is beyond every kind of burnt offering and sacrifice that anyone would ever give to God. And Jesus looked at him and guess what Jesus said? Man, you are not far from the kingdom. Jesus was so pleased with the thought of this man's heart. And Jesus said, you are not far from the kingdom. Meaning, and I believe so, hey, when the kingdom of God comes, you'll be one of those that will easily get it. Because now in his day, sacrifice and burnt offerings were the thing. But he's someone who had looked at it and began to question, just like we do today. And sometimes when people begin to question, it's all like, hey, must you question it? Why don't you? No, questions are good. It shows that your heart is trying to grab something. Don't ever despise people when they ask questions, especially intelligent questions, not, not foolish questions now. See that now? Yeah, there are people who ask some foolish questions. People who come say, um, um, it must be tight in the New Testament. Now, there are people who ask that kind of questions genuinely because they want to know. But there are people who come and when you hear their reasoning, you will know that these people are people who don't want to give to God. So they are trying to justify. That's why it's important the kind of messages we preach. Because you might preach a message and someone whose heart is not right, will take your message and use it to become a wall in his heart. See, after all, that pastor said, we, we, we are not supposed to tighten the New Testament. Both the pastor and your heart, they are wrong. See, they are wrong. But there are important questions people ask to learn. So, for example, Judas in John chapter 14. Now, I love John. You know, John specifically had to say, it's not his carrot. <laughs> And look at what I just said. It's not his carrier. <laughs> he said, he said, Judas, not his carrier, asked. And what did he ask? He asked Jesus a very I call that the most intelligent question in the Bible. That's me now. You can do your research and get another one. What did he ask Jesus? Now Jesus was talking about if you love me, you know, and 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 stuff, keep my word, I will come to you. And Jesus was saying all these things. And, and Judas was listening. And then he said to the Lord, he said, Lord, how are you going to manifest yourself to us 
and not to the world. Oh dear Lord, each time I read John chapter 14, I, 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 I feel chuckles, you know, I'm like, man, this must be the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I mean, Jesus would have just said, flesh and blood did not make you ask this question. You know what I'm talking about? Because that was deep. How are you going to manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Because he was reasoning. I mean, here is Jesus. Anybody comes to him. He is, I mean, God, he sends the rain to fall on everybody. They've not had the record that the rain was falling and they realized it didn't fall on the wicked, the house of the wicked. It falls on everyone. The sun shines on everyone. God supplied manna to everybody. So now you're telling us that this is special. So how are you going to manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Very thought-provoking and important question. And that's why Jesus never wasted time in going deep in the answer. See that? So there are important questions to ask. So this man asked a very important question. And, and the rich young ruler asked a very important question. He said, what must I do that I may have life? Uh, are you not living already? You know, so, like I said, someone will look at him and say, what's your problem? Me, like this. If God should give me a quarter of what you have, ah, are we, I have gotten life now. What else do I want? You see, that's the limitation of your thoughts. And there are people who come to Jesus like that. All they look for is what they will have, what they can get from Jesus. Because there are people who come to Jesus because they are sick. So if Jesus will just heal me, man, I'll be grateful for the rest of my life. Now that's not enough. Oh, if I can just build my house. Oh, if God, if you can just help me build a house. See, I will not ask you anything again. That is wrong. It's born out of covetousness. Your, the thoughts of your heart, they are wrong. You remember, um, 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 you know, as I say these things, thoughts are just coming to my spirit. You remember um, Philip when he was in Samaria. And then Peter and John came over and they began to lay hands on people to, to receive the Holy Ghost. And this man named Simon saw what was going on and he brought money to the, the, the apostles. And he says, Sirs, take money, give me this gift so on whom I lay my hands on will receive the Holy Ghost. Now, you want to think about it and say, I mean, the guy was thinking of how to further the gospel. So he wanted to sow seed into the lives of the apostles to contact. Yeah, we do it today. Praise God. You know what I'm talking about? If you want to contact this anointed, come and drop a seed. You know, we do those things today. They look okay. But hey, this man. See, sometimes if you don't, and that's, that's why we have, um, and, and cause truly, truly, do you know if they could have communicated that gift in, uh, upon him? Oh yes, they could have done that, done that. I didn't say they should have done that. I said they could have done that. It would have worked. But Peter was minded. You see, he 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 was, you know, you know. I believe, you know, the, the same thing. You know, like Ananias and Sapphira said, and Peter, full of the Holy Ghost, said to them, "Okay, I believe Peter was full of the Holy Ghost when he replied Simon. He replied him. He says, you're, you're wrong to even think." That the gift of God can be bought with power. The man didn't say he's coming to buy the gift of God. He's coming to, you know, sow seed into their lives. Praise God. But Peter was able to trap his thoughts. What was his thoughts? Ah, if I get this thing and add to my ministry, I'll be good. That's the same thing all people think today. But hey, that's covetousness. That's covetous. Covetous. You see someone functioning the anointing, and he tells, oh. If I get this anointing on my life, ah, my ministry is made. Covetousness. That's covetousness. Because you are thinking, see, covetousness is not the act, it's the thinking, the thoughts of your heart. So, um, number one, you are looking at something. If I can possess this thing. Now, that's what I've driven a lot of ministers. You, you see someone function in the anointing. You say, Kai, Kai, I need this thing. I need this thing. Why do you need it? I'm not saying it's wrong to desire it. But the question is, why do you need it? If I get this thing, people will come to my church. You're wrong. 
Hey, but I did it and I got and people started coming to my church. Wait till the end. Don't judge anything before the end. Wait till the end. You see that there are lots of uh, uh, preachers who've gone astray by such things. They've left the core of what God have called them to do. And they, 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 because they were desirous of another person's gift and they went after the gift. And there's a principle that that would, that would cause that to work. So they, they, they actually literally would sell everything they had. I mean, gave into that anointing. And they continued giving to their, that anointing. And soon they began to function in the anointing. Now, it looks good today. It looks wonderful today. The testimony looks stunning, you see. But then you don't realize one thing. Covetousness may have been the root of that thing. Yeah, but Paul says, covet earnestly the best gifts. Okay. <laughs> I won't go into that today because my time is up. Praise God. But I tell you this truth. When Jesus said, beware of covetousness, it's something you need to check your heart for. I'll see you tomorrow. God bless you. Bye.